Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Hey, do you know your neighbour this morning? I hope you do. I'm not talking about who's sitting next to you, your neighbour at your house. Do you know them? Do you know them? Because we've got to love God, love our neighbours. That's a good thing. Hey, good to see you here this morning. And um, I don't know about you, how's your weekend been so far? Yes. Sun's been out shining. That's a very, very good thing. Uh, for me, though, yesterday I spent six hours of my day as a parent to teenagers that felt more like an Uber driver or a driving instructor. Now, I love my daughters and my children. But is there any other parents here that feel my pain on a Saturday where it used to be like when you were back in the day, you just you could pick whatever you want to do for yourself. I, I, is, there, is there an app that someone could make where if you're a parent and you, you've got to get back to your house at some point, you can be like an interim Uber driver. That would make sense, right? Like, I think that would be a good idea. Anyway, that's my idea. Like, you know, if we're going to maximize the moment, the petrol's expensive enough, enough as it is. So it's good. Well, we're glad you're here. I know we've welcomed people. So glad you're here. Hey, thanks as well for everyone who uh, took the time last week to fill out a Connect card or those of you that will today. You know, we had 257 Connect cards come to our church last week here on the Gold Coast. That's a lot of people saying, I want to be part of this church. It's exciting. You're part of a church that is alive, breathing. Things are happening. People are finding Jesus. That's what it's all about. Well, we're in a brand new series. Everyone say Deep Dive. If you don't know how to spell it, it's right there for you. And Deep Dive, where we are doing a teaching message. And if you missed out on the message last week, it is actually, I would say, like important you jump onto YouTube or our podcast to get more context for this series. So last week, I brought a lot of context around this teaching message to help people understand what it felt like, the timing of this time in history. Who are the major players in the story? So I encourage you, you can go back. It won't affect today. I'll add in some of the pieces. But can I encourage you to really add to your learning and to maybe whet your appetite a little bit to, to grow more in your understanding of God's Word. This is a uh, going to help you a lot. Also, for this series only, um, if you go on our podcast, every week there's three podcasts being uh, available to everyone, which is the, the messages out of Sydney and Melbourne as well. So you can, you can deep dive and you can go through Nehemiah, Colossians and Galatians, and I'll tell you what, you'll be a very, very well-versed Christian at the end of it, or increasing in your understanding of the Word of God. So that's a good thing, right? So you can jump on. Uh, I, I, just, I got to hear Pastor Jimmy's message from Melbourne. Though. It was, it's really good, really good to talk about Galatians, and so I encourage you. Well, let's pray this morning. Is that okay? We're at church. We're not at the football today, so we can pray. It's good. Thank you, Father, for your Word. Let this uh, message come alive in people's hearts. I pray, Lord, not only would it bring revelation in the moment, but God, it would also uh, it would help us tomorrow when we're with our friends at work on Wednesday when we're dealing with a relational challenge or this week on Friday when there's a disagreement at home on what we should be doing with our Friday night, if it's football or if it's spending a date night together. God, we just pray that whatever is going on this week, that you'd be so present in every, of, uh, every one of our moments. And God, let this, uh, let this message cause us to become more like you. Let, let us leave here different. Let us see something different. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in the book of Nehemiah. It's page 410 of your Bible. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to that. And um, let's out of interest, give me a wave. Who this week is a high achiever and went ahead and started reading some of the Nehemiah? Just give me a wave. Okay. Anyone go back and read last week's just to justify and verify everything I said? Probably you should. That's a good thing as well. Okay, so you, that's, you know, I want you to actually, like, for yourself, you should be learning and growing. So here's a little bit of context, and then we'll get into it. Okay, so we're at the point of the story. That was Nehemiah 1 and 2 last week, uh, where Nehemiah has just arrived in Jerusalem. He's heard these horrible, the horrible news that the walls of Jerusalem are in, in decay. People aren't doing well. The economy's gone into absolute rubble. And so he turns up, and he reports that it's worse than he thought. And so even though he wasn't born in Israel, he was born in a faraway place in Medo-Persia, uh, he actually, as the cupbearer of the king, has this burden because he was a Jewish man by descent and by birth. And so he has this burden on his heart to go back to, well, sorry, not to go there for the first time, actually, and to, God puts this, this, this vision on his heart to rebuild these walls that have now been decimated by the, both the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians. 600 years before uh, Jesus uh, comes into the equation in, in the storyline of the Bible, so it gives you a good idea of where we're talking about, uh, is when those walls were destroyed. And then 400 years, or 450 years before Jesus came, is when Nehemiah rebuilds the walls. Now, we know in chapter 6, it took 52 days. 
which is quite amazing considering the immense work that had to happen for this to take place. So we see the walls are in ruins. Nehemiah turns up and he brings vision to the people. He says, hey, we're going to rebuild these walls. Everyone's excited. Everyone's cheering. Everyone's like, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? And he gives them a strategy. And the first thing that happens is, surprise, surprise, there is opposition from the others that are not Jews saying, who do you think you guys are? It's not going to work. It's going to fail. And that's where we pick it up in chapter 3 today. And I'm going to be preaching today from chapter 3 and chapter 4. And if you want to take notes this morning, which could be very helpful in a teaching series, please write the title of this message down, Who's Got Your Back? Who's Got Your Back? Ellen asked me this week, how, how, how big were these walls? I mean, Ellen's been there, but we're like, it's a good question, I don't know. And so I did some research and discovered that the walls in its entirety, because it wraps around like a big circle, but not a perfect circle, is 4.1 kilometers in distance. It's quite a, a big wall. But when you understand the breadth and width, it's even more amazing. It was 12 meters high. So if you think about a diving tower, a 10 meter tower, if you've ever, if you've ever been on one, if you look at it from above, you're like, oh, that's impressive. But when you get on top and you look down, you're like, no, thank you very much. It's high, right? So 12 meters, another two meters high. And at its widest point was 7.5 meters. At its skinniest point was 4.5 meters. So some people were being lazy on the rebuild. Others were being... So you're talking like 7.5 meters wide. When we were in Israel, our tour guide said to us, and she's not a Christian, she said, so far they have been unable to find a crane anywhere in the world that can lift one of the size of the blocks from the wall. Such was the magnitude of the quality of the build. So we're talking about high quality. It's not from Ikea. It's like a legitimate, genuine, like God bless Sweden, but just, you know, we can't put the wall. It's not a quick fix. It wasn't like a render. It was a genuine wall from rubble. So let me just show you a picture today. This is, this is kind of what they were working towards. This is like a bit of an old school, like back in the day if it was Sunday school. Anyone remember that with felt boards? Yep. Okay, so this is, church was a lot better now. A lot better now. It was good back in the day. It wasn't that good, but this is better now. So this is a bit of an overview of a lot of imagery coming at you, but if you can look at the wall for a second, you'll notice there's a few gates there. You've got Herod's Gate, Damascus Gate, Lion's Gate. So in total, there is eight gates uh, in the old city of Jerusalem. Now, when you go to Israel these days, you've got the modern city, and then within the modern city is the old city, and it's like it's going for like a time warp, like modern into like, whoa, where am I? You know, it's interesting. I remember walking uh, the first time we walked in the gates here, Damascus Gate. I was walking along here, me and Ellen. There was a guy standing here with a big yellow snake around his neck. He was very, very confronting. Now, if, if you're a Jewish person, you are not to this day allowed to walk through those gates because that's the Muslim quarter. It's, there's four quarters of the city. There's a Jewish quarter. But the, such is the, the tension you feel there that even within the old city, that's 4.1 kilometers in, in its diameter, even within that, there's tension because you've got now the four quarters. And so... Me and Ellen, because we're foreigners, we're allowed to walk in there. And we didn't realize the first time that we, we wandered down to the old city. Uh, it was a Friday afternoon, and it was uh, right at the peak of Ramadan. So up at the, um, the Rock of the Dome, Dome of the Rock, Dome of the Rock. Thank you, Pastor Tom. Uh, that, that is where like, all the Muslims are going as part of the, uh, the celebrations of Ramadan. And so we're walking into the city, and they've just finished, and they're all heading out. It was quite a confronting moment, and Ellen actually was quite fearful. Uh, and she was like, we were dressed, it's 40 degrees, so she's wearing like a typical, you know, like 40 degree outfit that you would have, it's pretty hot, you've got people that are coming out of the city, we walk into the city, and it's, it's, it's tense, you can feel it, and as we get to uh, like that point of like, okay, this is too much, we duck down a side alley, we look up and above us, it says Via de la Rosa, and Via de la Rosa is, if you know uh, much about the crucifixions, where Jesus walked, and so even in the middle of our chaos, we look up and we're like, oh, this is the place where Jesus, literally in the chaos, was crucified. It's quite an amazing place. And we get to uh, chapter 4. So you've got now context. How big are these walls? Why are we rebuilding it? Well, without walls, you're in danger constantly. Okay, It's a simple. You're under threat because you can't protect yourself. You don't know what's coming in and out. So they've got nothing. All the gates are burned. The, the, uh, the walls are burned. You can take that away now. And so we now find ourselves in chapter 4. And in my Bible and many Bibles, it's got the, the heading, Opposition to Rebuilding. Opposition to rebuilding. At first, Sanballat and the other governors, they joked with the Jews for dreaming about the idea of rebuilding. They kind of were cynical and mocked them. 
But we pick up in chapter 4 that it goes from cynical and mocking to now genuine threats for their life because they're actually getting some work done. It's amazing. People will say things about you. They won't take you seriously when you're dreaming about something. But when they start to see some runs on the board, when they start to see your business start to grow, when they start to see that relationship start to bloom a little bit, all of a sudden, that's when opposition comes in, right? That's when it turns from feeling like, could this happen to genuine fear the enemy will deploy into everyday situations? In this situation, there was no threat until halfway up in verse 6. The walls are now halfway up that there is a death threat saying, you better watch your backs because at any moment we could kill you. You won't even know we're coming. You won't see we're coming. We're going to kill you. And so this has now turned from a, a scene of, okay, it's absolutely desolate. Someone steps in and says, we've got vision for building. There's belief in the camp, but we're now halfway into the process and we now add that people are tired. People are tense with one another because they probably haven't slept all that much. And now there's word on the street that we are under imminent threat that at any moment an arrow could come right for your head and you wouldn't even know it was coming. You can imagine the tension point that would have been felt. People would have been doubting, is Nehemiah really the right guy for this job? The guy was a cupbearer. He's not a construction manager. He's not an army general, but are we trusting this guy? Are we going to trust this guy? And I want you to hear me very carefully today, that when our walls are down in our life, when we are vulnerable, who we trust and the people we place around our life, they really matter. They really matter. The kind of voices into our situation. That could be from sitting with a counsellor that you just feel a little bit off in that moment where you're like, does it feel right? To another counsellor, like, oh, this feels like the right, this is the right person to be able to trust. Everyone's got their own lens. Everyone's got their own worldview. And we see in this story in, that Sam Ballot starts really bringing fear into the camp. And in verse 2, he says this, can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? He's speaking in the natural. Can they really do this? What he didn't realize as well is in this moment, there's a prophetic picture going on that 450 years later, Jesus is going to be in the same area, in the same place. And they said, he's dead, he's buried. But yet three days later, the power of God descends from heaven and he rises from the dead. And it's a prophetic picture that even though the walls might be down, the walls might be dead, that Jesus gives us a picture that the hope is not lost. All is not lost. When Jesus is evolved, everything can come back to life. I don't know what you're going through right now. Maybe you're here and you had to pull yourself to church with a challenge in your heart of what's really going on right now. Maybe you're here today and you are ticking a box religiously because in your heart of hearts, it is actually a very, very vulnerable time in your life and you don't know who to turn to or what to turn to, but somewhere in your heart, you know you're supposed to be at church. Maybe you're going through an absolute trial right now and you've never been to a church where you thought, I've got to give something a try. And if you're here today, you are in the right place. Trust me, you are in the right place. And I believe by the end of today, your life can change forever. If you've had people speaking over you that things are hopeless, they're faithless, they're impossible, you're in the right place today because we're in an environment like Josh said before that we're believing that when you bring the name of Jesus into every equation, dead things can come to life, hope can rise, faith can be built into the hearts and lives of people. But what a picture. 450 years later, Jesus comes back to life right there in Jerusalem. Maybe you're here this morning and you're chasing a dream. And it went wrong. So the people around you are doubting you. Maybe you went after a business opportunity and you know God's speaking again about doing things differently this time, but your wife's like, I don't know about that. I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I understand why you would feel that way. Maybe you're here today and you've been pursuing that qualification and realizing it. I've lost the desire. It's not what I thought it was. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking to yourself, I've been pursuing that guy or girl for so long and it's just not working. I was speaking to a person yesterday and said that their daughter had been dating a guy for five years, you know, kind of in those prime years of her life, 27, sorry, 22 to 27 uh, for, for this, in the context of the girl at that point, and how that, that, that horrible feeling of like, what was the point of that? I thought we were working towards being married. I thought we were dreaming about saving for a home together. The next thing, where do I go from there? When the walls feel like they're just blown out, the rubble's on the ground, what do I do to rebuild my life? Rebuild relationships. What do you do when people make fun of your dreams? 
what do people do when they don't believe or don't back you? What do you do if you feel like your self-worth is like a big heap on the ground and you don't know where to start? What do you do if you feel like you're visionless because you can't see a better day? And that's how the Jews are feeling at this point. They feel shame. This once great city is in ruins. Our culture has been decimated and it's now strewn across the Middle East and we don't really have a, a home as a people group. Not for the first time. But they're there again thinking, how do we get here again? The question would be asked, can we really rebuild? Like, can we really, really do what Nehemiah is saying? And I think there'd be fair questions to ask if you know that you're now under attack, an imminent attack from the enemy that you don't know. Come, it's like a Black Ops, Black Hawk Down scenario about to happen. And if you're here this morning and you're doubting that God can rebuild your life, if you're here thinking to yourself that you try to get off the mat, you try to step up, and for whatever reason, the first feeling is like fear, intimidation. Listen to me carefully this morning. That is a lie from the enemy. The enemy will do everything he can to rob you in the seed form of your destiny. Do everything you can to get bigger than the scenario. And there's only one word, one name that is greater than any scenario. His name is Jesus. Proclaim his name. Declare his name. Exalt his name. Put his name above everything else. Put it on your mantelpiece if you have to. Be reminded that he is the only way that things can be rebuilt as long as he is the foundation. And we'll pick up the story in Nehemiah chapter 4 this morning. I'm going to read from verse 13. Because we now know that fear has got, got hold of the camp. It's the rumblings of fear have gone through the, the people. We know that even at times that the nobles and officials are doubting Nehemiah. And so it's at this point that we see Nehemiah step up with a God strategy. He goes beyond what anyone else is thinking. He goes, I'm going to give you a God strategy for how we're going to get this finished. It's halfway up the wall. Now we'll get the rest of the assignment finished. And that's where we pick up the story from Nehemiah 4. If you haven't got your Bible this morning, you can check it on the screen or you can download a Bible at the end of the service as a way to do that. Um, that'd be good. Therefore, this is uh, Nehemiah speaking, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. I love that Nehemiah, every time it looks like people are losing sight or losing doubt or they're not sure, he always goes back to not, oh, I'm a great leader, look what I can do. He goes back to, I want to remind you, in every chapter he goes back to, remember that we are serving God, this is God's vision, this is God's purpose, and it's a good reminder, as long as we're serving after God's will, we can go to God. Verse 15, and when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. And here's where things get interesting. In verse 16, from that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, with shields, with bows, and with armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah, who were building the war. And those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. What a picture. Like modern day version. I've got an AK-47 in this hand and a tape measure in this hand. I've got a grenade in this hand and I've got a hammer in this hand. Like that's the picture. Like we're going to battle while we build. We're going to have a strategy here because at any time we're under attack. If you ever play Call of Duty... You know that there's two little perks you can get at the end? You need both. That's all I'm going to say. It's, it helped about seven people at church today. That's just a comment I, wanted, I feel like I needed to bring. Verse 19. Verse 18, sorry. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side, so they're ready. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Now get this. In verse 19, then the nobles and officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Whoever you, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Can you imagine? I'm two kilometers away here. And all of a sudden, everyone's tools down, weapons up, let's go. And off they go, down to the dung gate, and they're ready to fight. And what would feel like for the enemy is that all of a sudden there's this mass of people with weapons ready to go and aware, and it would, people would have backed off. And so every time there was a sound, people rallied around the sound. I'll tell you what, the sound, I want you to hear this, there is a sound of unity. 
there is a sound of unity. It sounds like something, it looks like something, and it feels like something. And these people knew that we were on mission together to walk towards, and when that trumpet sounded, we moved towards unity. We taught, moved towards purpose, and I want to tell you this this morning. What is the sound that we should be coming under? His name is Jesus. I can't wait for International Weekend next weekend, because it's a great reminder, no matter where we're from, no matter what we do, when that sound goes out called Jesus, we come under, and we sit under the mantle of who He is. It's our rallying call. Put our differences to the side. Put our concerns to the side. Our differences of political opinions. When Jesus' name goes forward, we come to that sound. Verse 21, so we continue the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. That's that's an all-in approach here. Everyone's in. We're, we're, we're not only working, but we're now security guards. We're on venue safety, and we're also on the construction team. Neither, this is verse 23, neither I nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he, even when he went for water. In other words, we never got comfortable. We never settled. We never lost sight of why we were there. We never lost our guard. We were ready, on guard, ready to go. So what can we learn from this this morning in our own lives? And I want to give you four thoughts today as we finish. Relational lessons from Nehemiah for building our future. Four relational lessons for building our future. The first one is this. Acknowledge when you are vulnerable. Acknowledge when you are vulnerable. You might have heard the saying, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Or show me your five closest friends and I'll tell you five years from now where you'll be. And that's good if you're having a good day. But when you are vulnerable, when all of a sudden your wife or husband walks out on you, when the finance company comes knocking and says that this company is going to get closed and liquidated, when you get you hear news that the company you invested in got liquidated and now you've got none of your life savings left, when you have somebody turn up and say there's an accusation that's been made against you, At the best of times, you want to make sure you know who your five friends are. But at the worst of times, listen to me carefully, you need to be super intentional. You need to be super on guard as to the kind of people that are going to influence your life and have your back or not have your back. And the way that you do that is firstly by acknowledging, hey, this is not business as usual. This is not normal times. This is not me hanging out with my mates around a barbecue. I am in a problem and I am vulnerable. I potentially could be manipulated right now because my walls are down. I could be misused, mishandled. I could give my money to things I shouldn't or wouldn't normally. I could do things in my life that I wouldn't want to do otherwise if I haven't got the right people around me going, be careful. That's a good decision. That's not a good decision. Don't date that guy. You're vulnerable right now. You're just emotional. But the people that we surround our life with in these moments starts from an acknowledgement, I am vulnerable. I am not thinking like I normally would think. I am not emotionally and EQ aware as I normally would be. And if you can be big enough, just like that sign when you walk in the door that says real bolder, if I can be real for a moment, if I can be authentic with myself, I need people right now that I can trust that are godly, that have got wisdom, that are going to point me in the right direction because while my walls are down and my trust levels are gone, I'm going to need the right kind of people. Where do you get that from? Where do you go? Who do you find that from? Because on a good day, those people might be your good mates. On a very vulnerable day, they could destroy your future. They could wipe your bank account out. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Do not be misled, because bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. You could say the flip side of that is good company only endorses and enhances good company. It enhances good character. It grows you. It it moves you in the right direction, which brings me to point number two. Do life with people that are building in the same direction as you are. Do life with people that are building in the same direction as you are. When you are vulnerable, when things feel a bit messy, when you're not sure of what's next, do life with people that are heading in the direction that you know for your life you're believing for. If you are in the middle of a marriage crisis, the best thing you can do is surround yourself with people with great marriages. 
If you are trying to move past an addiction right now, now is not the time to go and volunteer your time at a ministry that helps addicts. But yet, that sounds like common sense, but a lot of people don't have common sense when they're vulnerable. We need people around us helping us understand those people are building towards your future. Those people going off to the clubs every week, they're not. This is not your time to be doing that. Oh, you're super creative and you've got a gift of music and you love worshipping. All of a sudden you're off chasing some other dream that you, you think, oh, it must be the thing I need to do next. But God's saying, no, no, I've made you to worship in this season, not to do that. We've got to be aware that there's people that are building in the direction that are godly that can also help us build our life. Just like in this story, as they were building, they had someone that had their back so they could build. But if they didn't have the same purpose, why would they defend them? They wouldn't have. Who are the people in your life that have got your back? Who are the people that are defending you when you can't defend yourself? Who are the people that are stepping in when others are walking out? Because they're the kind of people that you can build your life with. They're the kind of people I would hope within the church community you'd say, man, that, those people, I can trust those people that they've got the right motives that they want me to point me towards Jesus and not some weird other idea. This is our year to be transformed. Hopefully you wear it on your wristband. The people that you're surrounding yourself with, maybe that's part of this equation. Who am I surrounding myself with? Are they building towards what God you have for my future? Do you know what you're building towards? The good questions that we can ask ourselves. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 10 says, If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. Have you ever been in a scenario where you've had a friend? Let's just say in this scenario, let's call him Bob. Bob's 17, and he's the life of the party all the way through his year 11 year, his year 12 year, goes to university, he's on, the, he's on the university rugby team, he also is the captain of the chess team. This guy's a high achiever, right? All the guys love hanging out with Bob. And then one day at university, across the, across the quadrangle, he sees this beautiful young woman, and he meets Lucy. For the next 18 months, none of Bob's friends hear from him ever again. Some of his friends are saying, Bob, you're a, you know, all these other things that said about him and all these weird things going on. What was once he was organizing who's going to the movies, what sport event we go? No one hears from him. We don't even know if we've got his number anymore. Bob gets so enamored with Lucy. Lucy's looks and emotions, and she's got him around his little finger. And then one day, all of Bob's mates' phones start ringing off the chart. Oi, what are we doing this week? What are we doing this week? We all know, guess what happened to Bob? He broke up. All of a sudden, it's, how do we get that relationship back? You know those people? What's your first reaction to that? Everyone's like, ah, oh, I know. You're one of those guys. Oh, you're one of those girls. I'm sorry, I've learnt my lesson. Yeah, we'll see you next time, hey? Firstly, don't be one of those people. Don't be Bob. Don't be Bob. So if we're building the same direction, we're moving forward together. We've got a plan. Those friendships are still there. They're not different. They're not changed. And I just think it's really important that in life that that's a really simple example. And you've all seen those people. Maybe you've been that person and you know what it feels like when all of a sudden things crumble and you're like, who do I call? What do I do? Now for a moment, I want all the men to look at me for a second. Over the years of pastoring, I have come across some tragic scenarios that a man's behavior has impacted not only his own wife, but all the kids and the family and potentially generations to come. And if I could trace those moments back to a particular moment or trace where did things go wrong, this is what I would say to you in every scenario. That particular man stopped having friends. He moved from having mates to having acquaintances or moving from having buddies to having colleagues and got busy with the kids and dropping them off everywhere. It's okay, I'm, I'm doing all right. I've got friends. But you know, like, you know, like dropping off kids and their life just became a slave. And before they know it, they end up in a place where when that thing happened or that moment took place or that tragedy happened, they didn't know who to call.
If you're a man here this morning, you need to know that the way that you were brought up when you were in a playground kicking a soccer ball around with all your buddies or playing handball or whatever it is you were doing, if you're not careful and intentional towards having some brothers that will have your back in the good time, the bad time, whether you're 45 or whether you're 25 or whether you're 75, when bad times come or when challenges come and you don't know who to call, That'll be a picture of whether you invested and got intentional that you had someone that had your back. You had a brother you could call and say, hey, I need some help. Hey, I, I'm in a situation right now. I don't know how to tell my wife what's just happened. I don't know how to tell her that I've just lost all of our money. I don't know what to do. And men end up in situations where they do silly things that impact legacies for history. It could all be traced back to guys. Get back to be intentional with some mates. Wives, let your husbands go out with the boys occasionally. So you're like, hey, what about those girls? Here's what I found traditionally with girls. Over time, girls tend to be quite good at maintaining friendship and relationship. I don't know what the difference is. Maybe it's just the way we're brought up. But guys, maybe we, we, we try and like prove we've got it. I don't know. Hopefully we have lots of guys hang out. First step, men, get into some men's connect group. Get into a connect group. We've got guys who want to hang out with you. They want to speak life into you. If, if the only guys you know are your work colleagues that go out drinking every Friday night and your wife's saying, oh, not again, we've got connect groups for you. You can tick the box on the card later and we'll help you with it. The last one, sorry, the third one, almost finished, is identify the people who God has placed in your life. Here's what I found in relationships. Seasons come and go with re- relationships. Some stand the test of time, like just over the decades. Even if you haven't seen someone for a while, you just know it's going to be all good. Other scenes are like happen at times where it feels like it's a, a shorter season. Maybe there's a purpose behind it. Maybe when you're vulnerable, someone steps in and they're like the, the guardian angel in that moment to help out. But maybe there, there's a time that God appoints a person or a, a group of people into your, into your world and you look back and go, man, if it wasn't for that person, if it wasn't for my connect group, I don't know what I'd do. It's those God moments where God brings relationship because God is relational God. He wants people to have healthy relations in the world we're living in. Love God, love people. For those of you who are married here, go back into your wedding albums and have a look at how many people you still know. If you want me to prove about seasonal change. Maybe even your bridal party, you look at it and go, I can't even remember their name. Some people you might go to their house and they've cut out their faces because they had a disagreement and they've removed them. Some of you are like, what do you mean cut it out? We can just Photoshop it. Well, we couldn't back then, okay? We had photos. We had to physically. But things come and go right. What I want to say is be a detective for who is God putting in your life in the right moment, in the right time, and especially when you're rebuilding life. Who are those people that are going to speak life into you? They're going to encourage you. They're going to bring the walls back up in your life. They're going to help build trust again. And be aware of the people that could come in and manipulate you, take your money, say things they shouldn't, do things they shouldn't, Play on your emotions. Women, listen to me for a second. If you've come out of a relationship and it's been damaging, be careful of guys that are very specialists at playing with your emotions. Those players out there, they're not even separate from even in church environments. Guys, if you catch you doing that, good luck to you. We've got some big boys here. We do. It's our job to be protectors. No, no one would do that here, but I'm just saying, just, just for the record. We've got a, place, a safe place. Be careful. That wasn't a threat, by the way. It sounded like it was, but you can work that out how you want to work that out. There's some big boys there. Uh, number four, the last one. As they wish to come and join me. This is, this is a fun one. Rest time, play time, or go time, they are all the same. I want to speak for the last few minutes about having friends in our life that are consistent in every season. We see in the story of Samballot, we see the story uh, of Nehemiah and these men, you see that there's days, there's moments where they're like, they were resting because they, they were now resting because they've been working all day and then they were getting water and then they were, they were, they were out with one person with, in front of them. You see this picture, whether they were working, whether they were playing or whether they were getting water and eating, they were, still had each other's back. They were the same in every environment that they were in at all times. And there's nothing worse, in my personal opinion, of friends that change from one environment to the next. Have you ever had that friend 
They're like, when you're with them, they're like, man, it's so good to have you in life. And then they go to another group of friends and they don't want to know you. You're like, what the, just happened? Are, are you hanging out with your church friends after church having KFC? Who wouldn't? And then your friends from work walk in and you're like, oh, I don't know these people. Or we're in environments where like on a Sunday we know how to be holy and say the right things and do the right things and worship. But then someone invites you to their home on a Thursday night and you turn up and you're on the campfire, they start gossiping. It's more subtle, the undermining of people and even to the extremes that they're getting drunk around the fire saying whatever they want to say. You're like, man, that doesn't make any sense. Last Sunday you were this, you're now this. You turn up to a connect group and somebody just starts to say things. You're like, yuck. Like these men knew what it looked like to be consistent in any, every environment. And I want to encourage you this morning, whether you're that person that is vulnerable right now, is that place yourself around people that are consistently built towards what God has for a better day. And for those of you maybe that are in a good season right now, and you are that person who's a friend, the greatest gift you can give them is consistency in every environment. My aim is to be the same guy when I'm up here preaching as I am if you see me on Tuesday at the gym. I pray that your goal would be that when you're dropping off your kids at the, at, at, down at the, the school drop-off in your active wear, that's the guys, that's like the girls. You walk into church on Sunday, that you're the same person. Even better, in the good times and the bad times, you keep going back to kissing, saying, God's got this one. I don't know how I got here. I don't want to be here. It's hurting right now. I'm in pain. But ultimately, God, I trust you. And we're responsible for the people that we surround our life with. You've got to be vulnerable in your vulnerability. You've got to be aware of it. You've got to identify the people that God's bringing in. You've got to build in the same direction. You've got to be consistent. In Proverbs 18 verse 24, it says, One who has an unreliable friend soon comes to ruins, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That friend, his name is Jesus. Would you stand your feet this morning? Deep dive, who's got your back? Last week I was in uh, uh, up at, here at Seabus Stadium here at Rubina and we we're watching a soccer game. One of the English Premier League came, teams came over and I had some tickets from, uh, from a friend here in the church actually. And my, um, uh, my friend was up from Sydney that I hadn't seen for a, few, for a while actually. And obviously COVID kept us separated and he lives in Sydney. He's, he's busy with his kids and my life. We're, we're only a few months apart. And, Anyway, uh, I knew he was here on holidays and I called him and said, hey, why don't we go to the soccer and we'll take Judah and your son and they're the same age and we can just all hang and not really forgetting the fact that they kind of really didn't know each other because they just assumed they know each other. So we go down to the sea bus and um, actually one of the young guys here, Vidal, was here next to us and gave them pizza shapes. Thank you very much, Vidal. Very friendly, friendly young man and single, ready to mingle. And then we got chatting and we, we realised, we said to the boys, hey, boys, you guys are like eight. We're 40, 41, he's 42. And I said, you know, we've been like mates since we were five years old. We went to church together. We went to school together. We did a lot of life together. I said, yeah, I live here. He lives in Sydney. I'm the one who moves away. And he runs a plumbing company. I run a church. And where we hang out, like those things, little, for uh, nothing at all. We're just hanging out. We're just two friends. We've been friends since we we're five years old. And the two boys are sitting there going, you're saying, like since we were this little, you, like, you guys, are, like, they couldn't work it out. And, like, and Judah asked this question, he goes, like, but I don't know him. Because he visually like, didn't know him. Even though every time I'd hang out with him, it'd be like in other scenarios, where we was just having catch up from Sydney and having a meal. And I, I said to him, that's right. I said, but if you had seen the journey, Judah, of that, that Ben has been there in the good times and the bad times. He's been a person I've called on a really fun thing that happened. I was, hey, I'm going to get married to Ellen. Or I was there as his best man at his wedding. Or there's been moments where there's been tragedy. There's been challenges to take place. I said, it didn't matter that we weren't physically always together, but our hearts have been connected since we were little. And just like you guys are sitting here having fun, that's the same thing for me. I said, we, we have that. Even though we might have not have seen each other, we can just click straight into it. 
because we've got each other's back. And I wonder this morning, when it comes to your heart, can you identify the, the people that God's put in your life that you can trust, that are there in the good and the bad, that, that can talk to you, encourage you, speak life into you? Or are you vulnerable right now? Are you in a place where you don't know who to trust? Well, I want to tell you this morning, if you don't have those physical people, my prayer is that even in this church environment, you will find those people you can trust. But there's one name above all other names. His name is Jesus. He sticks closer than a brother. He has our heart. He has your heart.